and welcome to Corporate Culture, your podcast about cooperation, conflict, and culture at work. Today, we want to speak about working environments and not in this abstract kind of way of working culture, um, but in a very concrete way, literally, um, about the spaces and the places where we work. And in order to do so, we have a special guest with us today. Uh, it's Mario Fernandez, and he is a data analyst and market researcher in facility management. In a second, we will talk about um, his role and what that is. But uh, first of all, Mario, thank you for joining today. Well, thank you for having me, Paul. It's great to have you. Mario, how would you explain your job to a child? Well, to a child, I would say that uh, what I do ultimately is to find out why workspaces change and how they change. As for a more complete definition, I would say that in general, the, the facility management industry, also known as FM, is dedicated to making sure that workspaces work for workers. So that is to say that they're functional, that they're comfortable, that they're safe and uh, both efficient and sustainable. All right. All right. And I said in the introduction that you are a data analyst and market researcher. So can you maybe give us a little bit of background, what, what you do in this in this field that you just um, explained? Right. So what I do, I, I do a few things, actually. So for starters, what I do is I analyze macro trends in the facility management industries. So that is to say, what is... Um, what, what are the priorities? What are the trends in the industries? For example, you know, um, as you know, during the pandemic, working from home became a big thing. It was right. something that was already rising, but it really uh, exploded in an exponential way during the pandemic. And after the pandemic, we've seen that it stayed. Uh, there's kind of a tug of war going on, whether to what degree it will stay in the future, but uh, there's definitely a before and after during the pandemic. And so I, for example, researched uh, this evolution and its implications for workspaces, but also how uh, workspaces are are managed, how they're distributed, uh, you know, employee motivations, all sorts of things in in this manner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, for those who don't know this term of facility management, can you can you give an easy, understandable definition? Right. So um, so as I was saying, facility management is an industry that um, and a sector in companies and outside of companies that make sure that workspaces work. So let's say that, uh, you know, for example, uh, your office spaces have everything they need, uh, the Wi-Fi works, maintenance in the building is done correctly. Um, you know, you have all the applications that you need to, to, to work, but also that work is uh, safe, that workspaces aren't bad for your health. So there's really like a, a big thing. And ultimately, more and more, we're seeing things such as uh, energy efficiency, uh, circular economy considerations with waste management. So it's it's kind of complete. It's the it's the management of the workspace uh, as a whole. Right, right. And it includes a lot of uh, different things that you just uh, mentioned. Um, I think that for many people, it's not really that obvious that this is uh, like an own category of management and it's very important. Um, yes. If you meet people that didn't um, get in touch with this a lot and maybe like small companies or or um, or just friends of yours who don't know what you're doing uh, and they would ask you why why would i need a facility management why is it relevant um what would you answer well uh for starters it's a very obvious thing when you go to a workspace when you go to the office you want things to work yes but you also want to make sure that you don't have any safety issues that you don't have any health issues uh, this could go from anything. It's, it's not just, for example, you know, you work in construction, you have a helmet, but in the office spaces, you want to make sure that air quality is correct. Uh, you want to make sure that, you know, lighting isn't hurting your eyes in the long term. You want to make sure that the chairs you have don't contribute to to back pain and to other deformities. You know, like there, there are a bunch of things uh, that uh, must guarantee your health and safety and work. And many of these things are, are legal um, requirements in, in many countries. So there's that, and even in exceptional periods, for example, during the pandemic, the people who were providing, you know, uh, masks at the office space, the people who were providing gel, the people that were making it possible for you to even work from home, all those people worked uh, one way or another with and for facility management. So all of that is extremely relevant uh, to to workers uh, in general. And so, so yeah, so there's health, there's safety. There is uh, the functionality of workspace and also just in general, making sure that you feel comfortable and productive in a workspace. 
Right. And what is your impression? Do you have the impression that um, facility management gets uh, the attention it deserves? Or how is the trend um, compared maybe all the pre-pandemic and now after pandemic? How do you look at this? Sure. So historically, I would say no. Historically, mm -hmm. facility management was sort of seen as a, well, kind of like, you know, uh, shadow workers in a way. Uh, you didn't really see them. Um, you didn't really notice them. And you just sort of expect that things worked. And if they didn't work, you would be angry. But if they worked, you kind of ignored the, the, the issue. Right. And this might be uh, due to historical factors. So I live in France. And in France, the facility management industry mostly came out of um, support and logistical uh, sectors from the military. So many people that started facility management actually came from logistics in, in the army. And then at some point, they progressed to, to the private sector. Uh, and many of these, uh, you know, Many of these jobs weren't traditionally very valued, but over the recent years, we've seen a very high prof professionalization of facility management and facility managers. Uh, we've also seen that companies have really started to um, think of their workspace, not just as something that they need to sort of solve and make sure that everything works on a basic level, but also uh, as something that can attract talent and can be key uh, for performance too. So in that light, uh, facility managers have started to get more and more attention because they are instrumental or they're seen as instrumental to the performance of the workspace. So for example, having not only having functional offices, but making sure that they're, you know, they're pretty, they're attractive, that they offer services that can be uh, seen as uh, attractive to talents that would want to work at the company. For example, we can see this a lot with um, many Silicon Valley companies, many tech companies that offer what we call perks and I don't know, a special fitness room, a special restaurant, all these things. So all of this has contributed uh, um, to a, a professionalization and uh, a better reputation and a better valuation of facility management as an industry. Yeah. And what you say, you know, to me brings to mind this picture of office, office spaces, right? Mm -hmm. But as you said at the beginning, a lot of people move to home office. So they work maybe from their sofa, right? Or from their bed even sometimes. Um, does facility management reach into the private spaces as well? And if yes, to what extent? That's a very interesting question. And in many ways, it is one of the questions that is affecting the industry today. Um, I would say that the answer, the general answer is yes. Uh, one way or another, you still work. If you're an employee and you have a salary, you work for a company, which means that even if you're at home, at some level, uh, the company uh, is at your house to, to say it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. However, the degree to which uh, the company's at your house depends on the country. It depends on the uh, the labor laws, for example. It, it depends on many things. It also depends on liability, insurance, whatnot. I know that in France, for example, some companies, not every company, but some companies um, at the beginning of the pandemic and some even today would want to make sure that the installations at the house were uh, appropriate uh, and safe. For example, I don't know if there were cables lying around, if there were any hazardous materials going around, and if there were, then workers wouldn't be allowed to work from home unless there was a very strict emergency. Why? Because in France, labor laws say that if you have an accident at work, even if you're not at the office, if it's during working hours, then the company's responsible. So because of this, uh, companies, obviously, uh, many of them want to make sure that they have no sort of uh, potential legal risks. So this could be uh, an example with which certain companies would, you know, have a more uh, direct or even invasive, you could say this, approach to, to working from home. Most companies, it's not the case, um, but it is a real question. Uh, beyond, you know, having Zoom installed or Teams or, or whatever, the question of companies being at your home in a direct or indirect way is very relevant to, to working from home. And it's something that is starting to be de developed and resolved now because, you know, th these are very open-ended questions. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if I answered your question, but, uh, you know. Oh, so oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No, it was, um, I think you said very relevant things. And it also made me think about my own experience uh, when, when the home office uh, time started because for me at the beginning and for many of my colleagues, it started with a lot of benefits. So we got like a second screen, you know, sent to our house. We had a, um, some even got a desks, new desks um, paid by the company, delivered yeah. to, their, to their home. 
all these kind of things to make life more comfortable and to to work in a more let's say professional way even if it's uh, if it's from home um, but what you said is also what I heard are also the restrictions right that to some extent companies can also tell you I mean I'm not talking about the color of your furniture but that some things in your house have to be in a certain way and right. this also to my in my feeling um is very much connected to work-life balance and it affects work-life balance not only in this way of the hours you work but also how you live in, in the end no of course yeah that's uh, that's definitely true and and you're totally right many companies have uh given new equipment to workers so that they can work better at home uh like you said you know better chairs better better tables um this isn't not it, this isn't just out of the goodness of the company's heart although some companies generally do want the well-being of their workers of course but you know it's also uh, a question of, of health and safety as well because as i said at the beginning you know if in the long run your workers are having worse and worse postures or you know bad habits then this ultimately can affect the worker but it can also affect performance because you know sick workers aren't productive workers so there's kind of a you know there, there's kind of a, a circular thing going on but but yeah um in a way, our homes, if you work from home, are also workspaces. So the the very classical frontier between, you know, I work at the office and I go home and both spaces are completely separate. Well, in, in a world where we can work from home and some, some companies even go to the extreme quote unquote out working full remote, well then in, in this case, it's kind of inevitable that the company will be in your home one way or another because it is a workspace, the company is liable you work for a company, there's there are productivity issues. So, but these are all uh, things that need to be resolved in a, in a balanced, nuanced way where the worker ultimately does not lose out. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, it sounds yeah. like a real challenge. And um, yeah. I also think in the future it will affect more and more people. Yes. Um, so it's, it's great that you work in this field and it's great to talk to you about these kind of things. Um, when I started, you know, getting in touch with this, um, term of facility management also talking to you uh, i myself had a misunderstanding a bit about your work because when we talk about work environment um, we often think about this abstract uh, like working climate or working yeah. culture like this you know environment um, but what 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 you work in is uh, yeah the concrete environment so the spaces the places um, where, where where people work but still especially because this term can be used in both ways, I think that there's, of course, a strong link, right? So um, I would like to talk a bit about um, your research and also your findings about the connections between facility management and the work culture. How does right. facility management influence the work culture? So uh, there are many elements to this question. For starters, I will say that, you know, HR policy, uh, organizational culture, uh, the organization in a large sense is of course relevant to facility management. Um, I would say facility management comes in a second level in terms of work culture, because, you know, first you need to establish, you know, what kind of culture you have, what kind of culture really exists in the company, your HR policy, all those things that are, that are relevant and, and interrelated, as you know. And then once you have that, your, your FM, your, at least good FM will be a consequence of this. It'll, it'll be a, a declination, if you will. So I don't know, let's say you're a company that values uh, openness, agility, et cetera. Well, uh, your office spaces should reflect that. It should reflect the fact that, I don't know, there should be less walls between, you know, between desks, between office spaces, which is the general tendency anyways, you know, flex office is, is, is a big thing. Um, but there should be that, you know, there should be services that, that uh, facilitate your life so that you know you're, you're dedicated to more collaborative aspects of of work so there are many things and uh companies that have uh really capitalized on this traditionally uh are silicon valley companies like you know like google like microsoft etc it's kind of um it's maybe not the best time to, to speak about certain companies because i know that silicon valley is laying off a few people but uh, at least in general from a historical perspective uh the um facility management and the workspace is a symbol it's a symbol of what the country, well, the companies in certain countries want to project as an image of themselves and an internal image to their workers. And that theoretically should be coherent with the work culture and the organizational culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that you made a very 
interesting point that you said the culture comes before the facility management and the you know the measures you're taking the 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 way you you redesign office spaces and so on because my feeling is that not all companies understand it that way i think there yeah. are many companies who think okay we will you know put some uh, fruit and vegetables uh, uh, there we will uh, buy a new desk we'll make everything in uh, open space um and this is yeah. our new work culture right and it, it's modern and uh, you know it's it's like google does and like the big company do we will just yeah. uh, change the um, the work environment in a sense the, the facility management and uh, and the work culture will you know follow or, or we don't even care that much so it's this is you no know, what you can see um but the work culture is something you cannot see you know you cannot build it um with yeah. furniture and I think it's a it's a very good point that you're making that this is actually the first step, and that the facility management follows uh, follows a culture that has to be established first. Exactly, and uh, you know we've we've all seen the the cliche startup thing where you know oh we're a startup and we're fun and we're agile because I don't know we have bean bags and a foosball table. Yeah. You know? <laughs> exactly. It's a you know it's, it's kind of like it, it's it's kind of the running joke in in the FM industry. This whole thing's like oh you know. We're, uh, we're super flexible, we're super fun, we're super this because we have, I don't know, a foosball and a beanbag. But then at the end of the day, the, the work culture and the organizational culture is not at all aligned with these two things. And obviously there's nothing wrong with having beanbags, there's nothing wrong with having foosball. There are many companies that have them and it works just fine. But, you know, having a, having a good FM is much more than just having uh, two things that maybe in reality no one will ever use and just become uh, decorations because i don't know you're in a work culture that is really into grinding in the working hours and then in practice even if you have them if if someone uses them they'll be like oh look well this person is slacking off this person isn't working so yeah. it, has, it has to be coherent that's the thing good yeah. fm beyond the um you know it, it Beyond in the hierarchy of needs, beyond you know the the Wi-Fi, the cleanliness, the functionality, safe and, and health, everything else has to come from a coherent look at work culture, organizational culture, and company culture. Otherwise, it'll be a failure. Mm -hmm. It brings me a bit to the next question that mm -hmm. I had. Um, if you can define some signs of of very good facility management, if there are some aspects that you can say, if this and this and this is implemented it's a very good first step or it's a very good sign that the facility management is working. Sure. So, so yeah, so as I was saying, just to be perfectly clear on this, uh, no level of good FM can solve HR problems. If mm -hmm. there's a toxic work environment, if things aren't working well uh, culturally or organizationally, then there will inevitably be uh, big issues and conflict. That being said, if you solve all those issues, and you decline, you know, the, the the new model, the functional model into good, good facility management, there are many things that you could do uh, to reduce workplace conflict and improve cooperation in teams. So, for example, if your workspaces are well designed and with good distrib distribution, uh, you know, in, in regard to your real needs, then there's less congestion, there's less noise, and as such, people will be uh, in a better mood and there will be less opportunities for conflict. You know, for example, sometimes when you see small office spaces, there's kind of a, um, you know, a hunger game scenario where people are fighting for, you know, every square inch uh, that they can. And then this obviously leads to conflict. So workplaces need to be well-designed. Um, also, you know, in general, if uh, you're talking about cooperation, then, when flex offices are well-designed or just when office space in general well-designed, then this should also facilitate cooperation by design. Many of these things should be by design as well. So that's one thing. Another thing is, um, you know, beyond safety and health in a very basic level, uh, you know, comfort and well-maintained physical environments are very important because, you know, through this, if people feel comfortable, they feel better. And this also resonates in better cooperation, better moods, less conflict. And this can go through many, many things. You know, it's cleanliness, it's good ventilation, it's it's proper lighting, uh, it's good temperature control. You know, there, there are many things here that could uh, contribute to less conflict and more cooperation. Uh, then, you know, if we're really going to the, um, the icing on the cake, and I say icing on the cake because everything else has to be true for this to be uh, relevant and add value, uh, you know, fitness facilities, wellness programs, 
good break areas, all of that obviously uh, helps in terms of you know well being, uh, reduction of conflict because people are feeling are feeling more relaxed and in general you know um, tools that help communication um, are very good, be they digital or otherwise. Uh, but again, that uh, point especially. Uh, is only true if communication is a real thing as um, in the work culture and in the organizational culture. Because as you know, you know, you can have many tools, but if people don't communicate, then the tools are kind of useless. Right, right. Um, and I, I really agree with you on the fact that we are both, you know, we are both physical and psychological yes. human beings. So uh, a very basic thing, but I also hear it very often, is uh, the temperature of the of the office. You know, yeah. I, I have colleagues who told me, you know, the office uh, in winter it's too cold, in summer it's too hot, um, and uh, it's it's not very attractive for people to go back to the office if the climate, like the real climate, uh, at home is a lot better. Like just uh, as you said, I think it's a really good example that a lot of people probably can relate to, um, and the psychological aspect, of course. Yeah, I mean. I think that we don't talk and think about it that much, but um, I think it, the the whole aspect of psychological safety, right, that we are talking yeah. a lot about, like that make people comfortable to speak up, you know, to to raise questions, all these mm -hmm. things uh, start also from this um, from the space, right? If we are all uh, squeezed together in one corner, seeing each other twenty four seven, I think that maybe tensions will arise uh, quicker than in in other settings, as you described. So um... definitely, yeah. So, so so you really need to create settings where, um, by design, conflict and cooperation is more likely. But to get back to your example on temperature, temperature is very interesting because, you know, beyond the appropriate temperature per se, there's also a gender perspective. Uh, many times when um, many countries have laws as to what the right temperature should be or, or the minimum temperature or the most appropriate temperature. And that law was established historically in many countries um, out of the out of averages of, you know, uh, what's comfortable and what's necessary for average office workers. The problem is that many of these averages were done in the 1950s taking an average office worker. And who was an average office worker in the 1950s? It was a man, which means right. that when uh, many colleagues complain about, about, you know, it's too cold, it's too hot, um, in some in some companies, uh, women have a higher tendency to complain than men. That's because by design, sometimes many of these averages have not been updated and haven't been designed for, for you know, bodily temperature, uh, bodily temperature differences between men and women, which have slightly... Uh, on average, slightly different body temperatures between a man and a woman. So, you know, these are just examples where we don't really think about it. It might seem counterintuitive, but facility management touches all these things. And it's interesting because facility management then is uh, relevant to issues of, uh, you know, gender equality. It's relevant to issues of social well-being. It's obviously relevant to economic performance, but it's also even uh, relevant to environmental issues such as the energy transition uh, you know, consuming less energy, but also consuming more renewables and the circular economy, as I said, with uh, waste management, with reducing waste, with reducing trash, with reusing trash. So there are many things that uh, where facility management is really at the center of many of our society's uh, issues. Yes, yes. And if now some of our listeners um, who maybe work in a company or even have some some high responsibility in companies, they say, OK, now I get it, facility management, we have to do more. Um, do you have some, let's call it low hanging fruit that people can yes. easily and maybe also um, cheaply um, implement, which have high impact? Yeah. So when people think about, you know, uh, well-being, uh, high satisfaction, they often think about very uh, costly and complex programs. Mm -hmm. Those are, they can help certainly, but if we really want to go for the low hanging fruit, you really have to make sure that your workspaces are clean, that the Wi-Fi works, that the room temperature is correct and appropriate, and that lighting and acoustics uh, work just fine. And surprisingly, these are really statistically the biggest factors that employees consistently say uh, are game changers for their performance. So, you know, I mean, I think deep down we know this. Uh, this probably happens to you, Paul, but if you go to an office space and it's dirty and if you have problems with the internet, 
and stuff, you're obviously not going to be very happy. And if, you know, it's cold if or it's too hot, all these things combined are really, really, really big aggregators. So if you solve these issues, then you will have, I mean, I'm not going to say 80% done, but you're going to, already going to be a big step of the way towards having a good work environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what would you say, why do so many companies not implement these simple things yet? Are there some reasons for that? I would say that, you know, sometimes the questions are, the answers are relatively simple. I think that many companies simply don't consult their employees as to what they actually need. They go with these, uh, I don't know, big ideas of what's fashionable or, you know, what's trendy. And maybe, you know, some, some executive has an idea and it's done top down, but in reality for things to work, you really need to consult your employees and the answers can be surprising. As for these low hanging fruit, well, this comes from um, many studies from many countries uh, where employees are consulted in, in different industries, but companies should have the reflex in general, not just for FM to consult their employees on certain issues, because I think this would really, not only would it be appreciated um, by employees, but it will also help uh, the company solve certain internal issues and be seen as more legitimate uh, with their staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of this slogan of the of the Bauhaus period where it says like form follows function, right? It's also what you yeah. said before, um, that it should be this way and not the other way around. Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah. Maybe as a last question, um, for people who are new in this field of facility management, they heard the podcast today, would you have a main takeaway? I mean, I heard a lot of very, very good takeaways from you today, but do you maybe have a main takeaway that um, professionals should know about facility management, no matter their field? Well, if you work at a company, you depend on facility management because you literally can't work without it since it provides everything you need to be productive, to stay safe and to stay healthy. That's for me, the key takeaway. You are dependent on facility management and for you to work, there are other people working so that you can work. Great. Mario, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Thank you for sharing your insights. Um, I found it extremely interesting. And um, generally, thank you for helping to make work a better place. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you for having me over and uh, thank you for this opportunity.